So we've all heard about the Ultimate 66. The 00 gauge guys think they've got there. But in N gauge, well, we already had some really nice 66s Farish, Dapol, and Kato. This is a Dapol. Uh, I've done a big upgrade job on this. It's DCC with a little surprise. Let's get the lights on. That's good. Obviously this is much brighter than the original uh, Dapol light for the uh, main headlight. It's dazzling, just like the real thing. And for the uh, marker lights, which are the two smaller lights, down at the same level as the main headlight, um, and these will switch to red when we change direction. So I'll just change direction like that. And what I've got here is a fiber optic cable which is a U-shaped fiber optic cable, you're looking at the two ends of it here and there's a switching LED feeding that cable. This is number one end of a 66. Number one end of a 66 has a longer cab. You see the distance there from the front of the loco to the handrails next to the doors. Well at the other end is the number two end, it's a lot shorter, that's a shorter cab. And on this loco, on, on all my DCC uh, machines, number one end is forwards on the controller. Forward. It's to the right, clockwise, on the controller. Forward is the number one end on the cab. When you're far away from the loco, imagine you're at an exhibition and you're running this, you can't really see what's number one end and what's number two end by measuring cabs too easily so what I like to do is put a cab light in the number one end and there it is it's got an ambient yellow LED in it which is called Proto White from DCC Concepts uh, I've got quite a lot of resistance in there that's why it's come out very yellow here but that's okay because the real life cab light I believe even on these uh, upgraded light cluster uh, 66's, it's still yellowish. So there you go. Now the cab interior I've actually stripped out because uh, these DAPOL locos are too light and the way I've overcome that is by uh, taking out the cab interiors which are a small piece of plastic uh, looking like this and I've actually just made the same thing out of lead. Always paint the cab interiors white if you're going, or grey, light grey, if you're going to put lights in them. If the inside of the cab interior is black, like it was originally, uh, when you turn the light on, you won't see anything. So it's got to be white, unfortunately. Maybe that's not realistic, but it looks great. And the whole point is, as I said, that from a distance, miles away, I can tell which is number one end and which is the forward end on the controller. In avoiding all those embarrassing mistakes of a uh, train pulling out of a siding and it goes backwards into the buffers and everything derails. Very uh, coarse weathering job which had been done with brushes and it looked like an army tank or something. Uh, so I got most of that off. And I just weathered the uh, exhaust area. It always blows with the wind uh, forwards and backwards for about the same length as the, the silencer. It covers the cab roof uh, quite often and they seem to have trouble washing that off. Um, okay, and then the final surprise really is this. Reasonably priced sound chip in it, I'll let you guess what that is. If I say what it is, everyone will say it's no good. If I don't say what it is, everyone will say this sounds fantastic. What's the chip? It's the cheapest chip you can get <laughs> for a Glass 66. Uh, and it's got a uh, twin iPad speakers. So obviously, I would have put uh, iPhone speakers hooked up to that chip. But you can't get any iPhone speaker into an uh, Engage model. All iPhone speakers are more than 18mm uh, wide. Uh, anything wider than 18mm doesn't go into these models. 
but iPads do have speakers of the right width for Engage. So uh, in here we've got twin iPad speakers. The Dapol early motor works really well with this chip. One of the drawbacks of these cheap chips is that you can't adjust speed. So you've got to be lucky with your motor. Uh, and by a bit of experimentation I've discovered that these old Dapol models, like the ND51, this, this one's called, uh, from uh, the early 2000s, this has the bigger motor. And uh, it works superbly with the chip. Okay, so you can hear it quite a long way away. And it's not tinny, it's got a good bass tone. Let's watch this 66 hook up to its first train ever pulled in their ownership. And let's give it a run. Take this car train out of here ready for the parade. Check which end the 66 is, so the end of the cab light is forwards. Okay, so we're going to go backwards in order to pull this train out of the side. Backwards.
Okay, I'm now checking out the uh, performance of the loco over tighter curves and inclines. So what we're going to do is send it into the inner yard to pick up this iron ore hopper and take it up to the top yard. Got some very steep inclines there, it's probably about 1 in 10. Highly unadvisable. And we've also got a very tight curve in here to the inner yard. I guess that's about 9 inch radius. Perhaps 7 inch is tight. Let's see how this duck or 66 goes around those curves. Turn the sound down because it's night time. This is on sound level 2 out of 8. So I'll just check the local direction because I don't actually know which one which way is forwards, so uh, this will reveal it. Okay, that one is forwards, so I'm going backwards and going this way. The 66 has made the extra lead weights in the clubs because without that they do weigh a lot more. Yes, I've checked the gauge of the wheels, it seems to be correct. The very wide wheels on these older models. Mm, they actually tend to cause shorts across points, which is very strange because old mini tricks had wide wheels. And that didn't do the same thing, so uh, there are some positives about these locos. But the inner design is quite unique actually. I don't know of any American models or Japanese models that have this kind of design. Well, that's good that it got over that. It's now the plane, the tough Bible Valley. At 1 in 40, in fact worse than that, it's about 1 in 10.
P66s are actually too realistic because they really are the true dimensions scaled down and the fuel tank is pretty close to the ground in this case the fuel tank has grounded out on a rail joint and it is simply too realistic because in real life you don't see defects like this for example which an engaged loco is supposed to go over here on that little hump okay we just have to help him over Let's go. As you can see, the tiny tail lights, which aren't very bright, are good in this you know, circumstance because they're not very visible when it's put in the train. They're not definitely not shining off the wagon. So it's pretty subtle and uh, quite happy that the alarm doesn't distract, detract at all. Once again, this loco is too realistic for its own good because these very long bogies, actually 66 has got very long bogies, from there to there is a huge distance and it's derailed, getting onto that ramp which is on a, the initiation of a curve as well. Yeah, one of the problems with the duck hole 66 is especially with these old bogies, is that they uh, derail a lot. The reason for that is, in order to have realistic length bogies, um, this becomes a very long, stiff arrangement. Um, and when they're going around curves, there is very little side-to-side -side play available in the axle. Back-to-back. Back-to-back back -to -back is the distance between the back of that wheel where my, where my pen is and the back of that wheel that's called the back to back measurement that should probably be seven and a quarter millimeters for this kind of wheel a wide wheel but there's an added complexity with dapol in that this cog here has no side to side play in its groove at all um, let's look at a loco that has a long wheelbase that does have a lot of play that's this Minitrix 9F. So on the Minitrix 9F, every wheel has an absolutely enormous amount of play, left and right. From the center line, it can move about two and a half millimeters in each direction, which is enormous. Um, look at the length of the 9F. You'd think a 9F is much longer than a uh, 66 is bogey well it is but look the 66 is bogey is almost the length of four axles on the 9f so the 66 is almost like two 280s going around a, a curve no wonder it derails a lot um, and the real problem on the 66 is the middle axle so on this 9f i mean this 9f has got five axles there it will go around everything on my layout and never derail. The Dapol 66 is derailing all over the place. Probably the main reason is actually um, 
that there's no play side to side in the center axle. That can only move one millimeter to the right and one millimeter to the left. That's not enough. That's why it's derailing when it's going over points. The uh, it's just not steering through, which is quite ironic because in real life a 66 has a steering bogey, an HTCR2 bogey, uh, which steers. <laughs> so if only the model had that. And uh, yeah, on the gauge, not only have you got to check the back-to-back -back measurement on a lot of dapples, this one's actually correct. None of the wheels have slipped. The wheels slip when things like the model falls on the floor. They just move a, a tiny fraction and, and that will cause derailments. But the other thing on the dapples is that this cog slides on the axle. Uh, in theory, when it's fitted in the factory, it's slid onto the axle. It has to be perfectly centered. If it's off on one of these axles, if it's off center, so the distance from the cog to the back of that wheel is not exactly as per design, that's another reason that will make this bogey derail on curves. Here you can see very clearly how the cog has to be central. The cog has to be central to allow play. If the cog's over to one side, then the Bogey can't move that way at all. On the right here you can see the Freightliner 66, the old Adapole bogey, and on the left is the EWS 66, which is in the newer style of bogey, uh, with uh, really the main changes the axles and the wheels. So the wheels are thinner profile. This is the pesky center axle. This, I'm convinced, is the cause of the problems. It's the fact that the center axle doesn't allow the other two to take a curve it makes the front wheel jump up or the back wheel jump up either happens as as these things go over the points so it's the center axle that's the problem there's about one millimeter of movement either way in that a one millimeter gap can be created you can't really shave the bogey down because you've got this whole copper strip arrangement plastic riveted behind that wheel which is really unfortunate new version there's basically quite a lot more play there's probably about one and a half millimeters of movement that doesn't sound like much but look I can actually put that into a curve shape roughly <laughs> which I can't do anything like with the uh, older bogey so that's the problem your points on your layout are the sharpest curves on the layout EWS guy back there. Right, so there's very little to play with with this old style bogey. I can't really trim down the black plastic to make it narrower to make the bogey go left and right more. What I'm tempted to do is actually squeeze these wheels together so that I've got a permanent curve looking down the left and the right of that bogey there. I'm going to try that. This may be a disaster. Uh, check back in. Okay, just spotted something else. So there was about a millimeter and a half of play, perhaps left and right, when we uh, had the bogey frame off. But actually, putting the bogey frame, that's that bit that mimics the ladder and the uh, cast steel structure of the real bogey so the bogey frame actually limits the axle from moving the first thing I'm going to do is now check the performance of this uh, loco over that troublesome point work with the bogey frame off which will give each axle about half a millimeter play extra okay so how to remove the bogey frame take the loco like that your thumb on this end of the bogey frame underneath. You got to get your finger in there just behind that coupler. That's it. And it left side on it. Okay, running it without the bogey frames on. 
made a big difference, it's a lot better. The Freightliner here and my Stobar, they both got the fat wheels. It doesn't suffer from the same problem and I realised it's got different bogey frames. And this is the, on the left is the original one and basically when you hold them next to each other the Eddie Stobart is much wider than the original Freightliner one, the older Dapple one. So obviously they realised that this old bogey frame was restricting the wheel movement and making it worse. So what I'm going to do is order myself for three pounds each a pair of bogey frames that are more modern. Got my new bogey frames. This is the new frame. Moving in the center axle is loads more, so that's really good news. I think that's going to make a big difference. much better it never could have taken that point um, at such speed before it had the new bogey frames fitted so £3.50 each bogey frame well spent there yeah that's good much better ok this is the articulation test when we come to the top of this incline there's a severe change in the ramp this way. There's a downside too, the old bogey frame could cope with very steep transitions of track.
load test. This load car has a very small amount of weight added in the fuel tank, but that weight probably only makes up for the metal that I've milled off the chassis to get the speakers and the chip in, so I would say this is the same weight as it comes from the factory, it's lightweight. Actually, adding a lot of weight to these locos, I've actually filled the cabs with lead on some of them. Uh, it really doesn't actually make much difference. The ones that have got lead in the cabs is the Freightliner and the Starbart, and they weigh a lot more than the GBRF and the EWS, which are basically have only had a tiny sliver of lead added to them to make up for what was lost. So. GBRF and EWS here are as they came from the factory in terms of weight and the Stobart and the Freightliner were more like a typical say American Coco engine uh, they're that kind of weight, you know, quite heavy none of them have got traction tyres and uh, actually I don't really think adding the weight to the two here it hasn't made much difference really. Um, I would say they can pull about 10-15% more than the uh, unweighted locos. But adding the weight does have its advantages. And I think the advantage isn't really in traction, it's actually more in getting over a bad track. So the extra weight I've discovered that this Stobart, for example, gets all the tracking perfections a lot better. That means humps and point work. on sound level one because my baby boy is sleeping upstairs. Let's put it on sound level eight and check out the difference. Now setting it to eight. Here's a good handy trick, but also quite dangerous. I'm going to program all the locos on the track at the same time. I've got four 66s here. Uh, nothing else is on the track. I've carefully taken off all my other locos in case any uh, damage gets done. So what I'm going to do is use the Rocco Multi Mouse Shift Menu program okay CV mode okay the CV is 182 okay the value is 8 that's going to give everything maximum volume on all the different sounds and it's going to do all these four locos in a one -er. let's do that okay
Okay, so these three locos are now programmed uh, with the maximum volume as well. So if we just go on to uh, EWS 66177 there with the white cab roof, number one brings the sound on. a slightly higher pitch sound in the uh, freight liner. The reason is this is EWS has actually got a smaller sound enclosure on the speakers. So it shows you the difference of the uh, sound enclosures. So both the um, Stobart and the freight liner have got enlarged sound enclosures that go right into the cab and you'll find that they've actually got louder horns. This loco has got manual, manually controlled lighting. It's not directional. It doesn't change when you change direction on the controller. That actually has advantages sometimes, like you'll now see. Pulling up with this train. Which it needs to reverse into a siding. Now we're going to change direction on the controller. If that was directional, that headlight would go off and red lights would appear. But a train reversing into a siding often just keeps its headlight on, as this one will. So I'll just change direction. Because it's manual, the light stays the same. 